Welcome to Booktopia TV. I'm John Purcell and I'm here with best-selling author Kate Forsyth to talk about a new series for kids called The Impossible Quest. Welcome Kate. Thank you for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, now I've read some of your works and they're rather large uh, in scale. This is very, very thin. How does someone with imagination as, as um, vast and as varied as yours contain themselves in such a small package? It's actually one of the reasons why I love writing children's books because it's the constraint of the form. It actually encourages you. I mean, every word has to count. You can't, you know, you, you can't take too much time or too much room over setting up the situation, describing character. You've got to do it so sharply and it's a really good discipline. I, I find it a really good discipline for me. Um, it keeps me uh, sharp and it doesn't do me any harm at all to write a bit smaller every now and again. Well, it's, it's got a very gripping story. You start off with uh, a boy in, in the forest who's grabbed by a wolf man or some kind. Mm, I love a, the yeah, wild man. Wild man. Yeah. Um, and I, I've got feelings of, um, of uh, you know, all the Game of Thrones stuff that's going on. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of medieval sword in the stone and that, that sort of mm. feeling about it. Um, but it does move very, very fast. Uh, and one thing which I, which I really admire in it is that it's not, the language is not dumbed down. Like it's, it's still got words in there yeah. that, that will have the kids thinking about it and very evocative um, uh, descriptions of, of the castle and, and, and the, um, the food uh, and, and the witches. <laughs> yes, I love all of this. Um, I actually think it's a big mistake to um, dumb down for children. I think that children are as intelligent as an adult, as an, probably more intelligent because they haven't lost any brain cells yet. I think that children have a true, I mean, their brains are hardwired for language. And this is actually when their lexicon is laid down. And so to give a child a simplified um, and very bland reading diet will mean that they, that's how their brain is set for the rest of their lives. I think that children love language and they love to play with language. And so one of my aims in this book was very much to have a playfulness, to play a lot with, with rhythm and with rhyme and with repetition, to play a lot with internal rhymes. You know, I think at, at one point a, a servant is knocked down and goes in, it's clang, clatter, clash, all the way down to the stairs. When I was a child, I would have loved that. And then I would have been repeating it. I would have gone clang, clatter, clash for the rest of the day, enjoying the sound of the words and the way that they all work together. Um, I find um, pretty much with The Impossible Quest, I was wanting to do exactly what I loved about reading when I was that age. So I, I imagined myself at 10 or 11 when I was to devour books. I loved books that had a great deal of sensual, you know, sensory detail, food and gardens. And I loved books where lots of things happen all the time and where you have that kind of breathless feeling that, you know, but when, when you finish the book, you almost can't catch your breath because it's been so exciting and so interesting and so surprising. And so I was pretty much, you know, um, it, you know, Sword in the Stone is a really good example of a book that I loved when I was a child. It was very rich in that sort of detail. But also the Narnia books. Narnia. Yeah. yeah. Um, the Little White Horse by Elizabeth Googe. You know, I, the, those books are such an enchantment to read. And so that's what I'm hoping to give to my readers. Well, I think if any, any parents who want the better kind of children's book, um, this, is the, this is the book to go for. And I think it will also, but I know your love of classic literature and great, mm. great literature of the past and also the, the great storytellers of, 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 for children in, in mm. past ages. So I think it's a great accompaniment to that. Um, tell us a little bit about the story because The Escape from Wolfhaven Castle is, is the first volume um, and there's going to be different, different, different yes. um, adventures. So the, um, the book has is, is been quite carefully designed. There were five books in the series. Um, and each book um, is a set adventure, but they all link, it's all one big long adventure that is, you know, it's a chain of adventures where each, you know, pretty much book two starts within seconds of book one ending, yes. so that you, you have this sense of, of the breathless headlong adventure. But as you go on through the story, more and more and more is revealed about the world and about the characters, and um, there are... You know, I like to think there's lots of unexpected twists and turns that, you know, you couldn't see coming. But once they've come, you think, yes, of course, you know, the clues were always there. And what we're doing with the book as well is um, it's a transmedia um, project. And so hidden in the book are a series of clues and secret codes and the, that you then need if you're going to access 
the, you know, the website and all the quizzes and competitions, they're hidden very adroitly. You've got to read closely. I, um, I gobbled down half this book um, before bed last night um, and I wasn't expecting, uh, I was expecting to, I better, I better have a look at Kate's um, mm. children's book and just see, see what it's like and get some idea of where it's going and found myself halfway through. It is, um, because it's so rich and, and it, it gives me so much, you know, it gives the reader so much and, mm. and all, all those things. Um, what I also loved about it um, was the, the characterization. So in a lot of, I think, poorly written books, you get a sense that there's so clearly marked that guy's a bad guy and this guy's a good guy. But you throw us a, a curveball in the first 20 pages with a perspective from, from someone who was being set up to be, mm. um, you know, it wasn't so nice. And yet you suddenly saw, saw the world from his perspective for a chapter and suddenly you got this whole different feel about the book. I mean, that char characterization, I think, is so important for kids to get mm. early. Um, so they're not going down that very bland world where everything is so clear. I think this is something that I like to do a lot of my books, both for children and for adults. And this is the idea of having, you know, one, a dynamic villain. So that the dynamic, you know, that, you know, the, the antagonist in the book can grow and change and you can actually, you know, you know, find yourself having a sneaking sympathy for them and then actually begin to kind of bat it for them and hope that everything's all right for them. And then the other way around, where people who you think of being as heroic, perhaps can sometimes not be as perfect as you think they're going to be as well. Because I'm interested, I, I guess I'm interested in the complexity of, of people. And the other thing is I like to surprise people. I like to have them think they know what's going to happen and then subvert those expectations. And so I nearly always have people who th you think are going to be good people ending up being bad people, which, you know, but I don't want to give too much away. Oh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful uh, story, and I, one of the things that's so so important with, with with kids' books is to get them from the from the word go, and this this, this mm -hmm. does that. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit about your adult writing. Uh, while, mm -hmm. while I've got you here, because we don't often get the, this yeah. chance, um, you've had some um, pretty incredible success with with Peter Greens over mm. overseas. Have, tell me a bit about that in, in Russia that sort of just took off. Yeah, so um, it, it actually sold um, more than a quarter of a million copies in less than a week. Which, I mean, you've got to say, it's pretty good, you know, I mean, and none of us were expecting it. So we were all completely gobsmacked. And then I remember, you know, they sent me a cheque, and I never get cheques anymore. You just get a, a payment that's gone into your bank. And I'm going, darling, I think they've put the full stop in the wrong, <laughs> in the wrong place. And then my husband's going, quick, bank it. <laughs> you know, I've got, to, I've got to ring them and say, I think they've made a mistake. He says, no, no, let's just, just bank it. I'm going, well, no, because then we'll spend it and we'll have to pay it back. So I ring my agent and I go, darling, have you seen that royalty statement? She goes, oh, no, I haven't seen it because it's done by Al. And so she goes, oh, that's rather nice. I'd better ring. And so then she rings London and goes and emails going, you know, we just want to check that this is... And all we get is a one-word email and it just goes, yep, with six exclamation marks. <laughs> I will admit there was a fair amount of champagne drunk that night. It was completely unexpected and it was it was a it was beautiful. And I mean I've always sold well in, in Russia. Or no, I've always sold in Russia. Mm -hmm. No idea how many I sold because you know you get your advance and then you never hear from them again. So I I got an advance and a royalty check from Russia. It was great. <laughs> it's been lovely talking to you again, Kate. It's been lovely to be, be here. Thank you for having me. Kate's new series, The Impossible Quest, Book One, Escape from Woodpile Haven Castle, is available from booktopia.com.au right now.